So, hello, Stephen. Hello. <laughs> so you're Stephen Duncombe, and you wrote this amazing book, <laughs> which is, uh, to me, the best book about zines. And uh... <laughs> well, well, when it, the funny thing is, I remember when it first came out. I was introduced as someone said, and this is, you know, so-and-so who's written what I think is the best work on zines, and I commented to them, it's actually the only work on zines <laughs> at that time, <laughs> but that was 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and now there's quite a few books out on but zines. There, there yeah. was one before, the one of... Uh, uh, Wertham? The, the world of, uh, yeah. Yes, the Wertham, yes. But that, <laughs> that was, exactly, that was... Uh, 19, I think it was in the late 1960s or 1973? 73. 73. Um, and do you know his backstory? Yes, yes. But he, you should tell him. Oh, no, <laughs> the, you know, the only other person that had written on zines is a fellow named Frederick Wortham. And he, the book on zines he wrote, mainly science fiction zines, kind of disappeared into oblivion. But what he's very famous for was he led the charge against comic books. Um, and there was congressional committees uh, citing sort of comic books as this danger to the youth, and he led the charge. He was, I think he was a child psychologist or something mm -hmm. of that nature. But he loved science fiction fanzines, mm -hmm. and he was able to differentiate the idea between sort of a commercial mass publication, like what the comic books he was looking at, they weren't alternative comics, they were mainstream comics, and the sort of the creation of everyday amateurs, which were science fiction fanzines, punk rock fanzines, political fanzines, and so on. Mm -hmm. Art fanzines. Yes, <laughs> art zines. So, um, so you just told me it was your PhD dissertation. Why, why did you want to work on, on zines? Um, like anybody who's contemplating writing a dissertation, you're, you're, you're faced with this idea of, one, what do I write about? Two, what can I stand writing about and researching for two, three, four years? Mm -hmm. um, and three, what has nobody written about before? Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, I was sort of looking around for a topic, and, and I write about this in the introduction to, to the book. I was working as a roadie for a band um, in Boston, and the band broke up when I got there, so I had nothing to do. And there was just fanzines every place. And I just started reading them. And I'd always, they'd always been part of my scene. I was part of the punk rock scene. Um, but all of a sudden, I started to realize, here's something which is really interesting. And what mm -hmm. I found really interesting about zines were how people were defining things like creativity, how they were defining things like work and leisure and community and individuality, and not just abstractly, because I was coming out of the academy where everybody defines those things all the time, but concretely and through some sort of artistic practice, um, putting these ideas out, on a, out there in the world, but also out there on a page. Mm -hmm. And so they fascinated me. And, um, and I started digging into it and then started talking to zine creators. And as I started talking to zine creators, I realized that they had so much to say about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so interesting that I kind of just went with it. And then I had the good luck to be doing this at the same time that this underground culture got discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and so that added a whole other dynamic as with the rise of Nirvana and the Seattle grunge scene, all of a sudden mainstream media discovered fanzines. Um, and I was doing this research while that was happening. So I was watching this sort of unfold in real time. And so I could talk to people about the tensions uh, between creating just for yourself and like-minded misfits and all of a sudden getting uh, publishing offers. Um, having advertising companies contacting you, seeing if you wanted to do design work for them, um, which really brought a lot of the sort of tensions of any, any underground culture, but the zine underground culture as well, into the fore. Mm -hmm. And so um, what was your methodology to work on that? Um, so it was a PhD in sociology, yeah. was it? very much a sociology met methodology? Not, ne not necessarily. I had the good fortune that my mentor wasn't a sociologist. He was actually a historian. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to a sociology department in the City University of New York, which was relatively loose in what they would define as sociology. Mm -hmm. um, and so they kind of allowed me to do what I want. My primary research methodology was a mixture of sort of literary criticism and old-fashioned ethnography. The old-fashioned mm -hmm. ethnography is I interviewed probably around 40 maybe 50 um, zine writers, and mm -hmm. would just talk to them, um, sort of open-ended interviews about what they thought they were doing, why they were doing it, and so on. 
Um, I also did, you know, participant observation in that I created a zine myself. Um, I was part of the trading that happened with amongst zines. And then part of it with the literary analysis was I just read thousands and thousands and thousands of zines. Mm -hmm. um, the fellow who, back in the olden days of zines, in the 1990s, not the real olden days, the 1930s, but the 1990s, how you found out about zines was through zines of zines, and the predominant one mm -hmm. was called Fact Sheet 5. Mm -hmm. um, created by a science fiction fan come anarchist fellow named Mike Gunderloy. When he got sick of doing it, um, it was an immense amount of work, you know, listing all of the zines, having little reviews, and then how to contact these folks. Um, he gave all of his zines to the New York State Library, and they still have something like, you know, 36 or 360 cubic feet of zines, which is a lot of zines. Um, and so I spent weeks on end um, in this library and just going through the zines. And the librarians, librarians are these people that love things, materiality mm -hmm. books. They would just tell me, they'd go, you know, you haven't seen this one, you have to see this one, and so on and so forth. And so I just read and read and read. And it was through that reading I started to realize sort of the themes that I would use to organize my book. Um, I didn't go into my book, and this is what I always tell my graduate students, don't go into a project with the themes already organized, let the material speak to you. And I really let the material speak to me as like, well, what are zine writers writing about? And one of the surprises was that they were writing about work um, all the time. They were writing about labor, yeah, um, really. creative labor, um, alienating labor, non-alienating labor, and so that became one of the themes of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your book has a very uh, strong uh, political dimension, and and to you, um, making a zine is a political act. Well, it was it was an exploration of the possibilities and limitations of culture as a political act, mm -hmm. um, and I do mean both possibilities and limitations. And so, mm -hmm. in some ways, it's a book about zines, but it was also a book about I think the subtitle, the politics of alternative culture. Mm -hmm. um, I was part of a cultural scene, uh, punk rock scene, really formed most of my life um, when I was younger. And I also became a political activist when I was 17, and that's what I do now. I'm mm -hmm. more or less a professional activist in mm -hmm. addition to being a college professor. Um, and so I was trying to figure out how those two parts of myself in a lot of ways lined up um, mm -hmm. with one another. Um, I think Frederick Nietzsche said, Every, every book of philosophy is also a book of autobiography, and that was true for zines yeah. as well. As I was trying to figure out how these, these things lined up, and, and I was very heavily influenced by um, Marxists like Antonio Gramsci, who really mm -hmm. saw the political potential of culture in uh, folks like Stuart Hall at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham, mm -hmm. England, who saw that the possibility of these subcultures in allowing for a space and a place for people to develop a new language of politics, um, a new way of understanding fundamental categories like work, like consumption, like identity, and like community. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also interested in its limitations, and in that insofar as all of these new definitions, these new articulations of a better world stay within the pages of a zine, they don't really matter all that much in transforming larger society. And so I was really trying to balance both sides. What's fascinating about writing a book that tries to be dialectical is that seemingly no reviewer can ever understand the dialectic. And so I would have half reviews saying he's overly naive about the possibilities of politics and so on and so forth. And then the other half that would say he's overly pessimistic that these can have no political impact. And then another group of people saying you know, he's right, rightfully pessimistic, and the other people say he's rightfully optimistic. And I was like, it's a dialectic. Both yes. sides are happening mm -hmm. at the same time. And the, the, the current state uh, here uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world sh also shows us that um, the producing culture as a political act somehow failed yeah. because um, the people in front of us just tell us, but we don't need culture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, and it failed and it succeeded simultaneously. I mean, one of the things you can see when you could argue about the right-wing backlash um, in the United States, but in France, um, you know, hopefully uh, <laughs> it, it will not come to fruition, but it, it very well, even if it doesn't, even if uh, Le Pen does not win, it's still something there. And it's all over Europe. It's in Turkey. It's in Israel. Mm -hmm. It's in India and so on. Um, 
That right-wing backlash is very much a backlash against the victory of progressive culture. Mm -hmm. um, insofar as these are people who feel that the world around them, the world of television, the world of mass media, actually does not speak to them. In a similar way that zine writers thought that the world around them did not speak to them. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, the, but they, just, they, they still felt the necessity of creating yeah, a culture. Right. The difference is that the right-wing nationalist backlash expresses itself politically, mm -hmm. um, whereas the sort of left-wing cultural backlash against mainstream culture in the 1990s expressed itself primarily culturally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was successful in, in expressing itself culturally, but without the political side, it leaves us open mm -hmm. to exactly what's happened now. And so you're working now uh, with the Center for Artistic Activism. Yeah, you got it. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so if, if uh, the people in front of you tell you, well, we don't need culture, we don't need art, mm -hmm. and how can it be possibly uh, effective to do uh, artistic activism? Yeah, uh, you don't call it art. <laughs> okay. um, you know, the, the, as soon as you call it art, then all of a sudden people categorize it as something they like or they dislike. Mm -hmm. um, it, but it's always something which they can understand. As soon as you call something a demonstration or a protest, mm -hmm. people can immediately categorize it as something they like or something they don't like. But nonetheless, it's something they already understand is over there. Mm -hmm. Why it's the Center for Artistic Activism is that we like to create protests that look like art and art that looks like protests mm -hmm. and get people to think creatively about the political tactics that they use insofar as they can do what art at its best has always been able to do, which is confuse categories. Mm -hmm. And by confusing categories, it allows an in to people who have become inured to politics. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not that we're trying to create art. In fact, we don't like art. Um, or we don't like political art, because most political art is art which is about politics. Mm -hmm. We're interested in art that works politically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Walter Benjamin makes this distinction in an essay he writes, the author as producer, in which he says, we need to ask of radical art, not what it represents, but what it does. Mm -hmm. That art about poor people, art about immiseration, art about white supremacy, um, doesn't necessarily work to combat those things. In mm -hmm. fact, it can perversely work to aestheticize them and make them the object of contemplation and actually even pleasure. Um, his uh, argument is we should always be asking what sort of work that art does politically in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, what he was interested in was this notion of blurring the lines between author and producer, which of course is what zines are, right? Um, and so one of the things when I was thinking about the politics of zines is not what, was, what were people writing in the pages, but the act of actually creating, the act of insisting that I have a right to be an artist, even though I have no art training, even though I may not even have any skill, to me was a really a radical ask. Because once you say, I have the right to be an artist, it's a much smaller step to say, I have the right to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. I have the right to have my voice count in all sorts of other avenues. Mm -hmm. So you wrote the, this book more than 20 years ago? Exactly 20 years ago. <laughs> no, you wrote it before. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, that's right. I did not write it. You published it years. 20 years so you're ago. You're right. I actually wrote it uh, probably 22, 23 years yeah. ago. And, and at this point, you were completely immersed in the zine uh, culture. Are you still interested in, in what's happening uh, in this uh, cu culture not, or not, in these cultures? Not really. Um, I still get asked about zines. Mm -hmm. um, But I usually shunt off those uh, questions because, um, unless the person's coming all the way from France, um, <laughs> I usually say, you know, there's better people to be talking about the current state of mm -hmm. zines than myself. Um, I think like many things that a scholar does, you know, you can either make your life's work about studying this small thing, or you study this small thing and you're so thoroughly sick of it after that time <laughs> that you do something else. I think... If you look at the, you know, I've written or edited six books at this point, and I've actually, no, I've written and edited seven books. I've only published <laughs> six books at this point. Um, they're all about the intersection of politics and culture, and so that there is a through line between that. Um, but zines were the, um, thing I was very interested in at that moment. Now, I was just, I was asked when the book was reissued to write about 
book, The Zines, 10 years later, and that was 10 years ago. And that gave me a chance to reflect a little bit about what zines mean in a digital age. Um, because when I was writing this, why zines were paper is because really there was no other viable medium around. Um, and as I was writing the book, desktop publishing was just beginning to happen, but the web was in its infancy. Um, flash forward 22 years, and you know, what is the web except thousands and thousands of fanzines? Um, that's what a blog essentially is, mm -hmm. it's a fanzine. Um, and so it, it caused me to reflect upon what is the difference between two things. What is the difference between a zine and a blog? Um, how do they act differently in the world? And the second one, which I didn't write about, but I've thought about, which is, why do a paper zine nowadays? Like, what what is the motivation to do a paper zine? Um, and how different is it from using paper when that was the cutting-edge medium of the time? Um, so, in answering the first one, how are zines different in the digital age? I mean, one of the things to, to and how are they different from blogs, is that the entry point into digital culture is technically open to everyone. Anybody with a search engine and a computer or a phone can actually find anything, right? The thing about zines, and I think this is why people still use paper zines, is that you have to be in the know to know where to get them. And because of that, the culture around paper zines is much richer, it's much thicker, it's much more isolated, um, much more ghettoized and elitist um, than the culture of the internet. Um, the culture of the internet is a thin culture. There's really no sets of values and mores and so on and so forth you need to know in order to access anything. But to know where to find, say, an art zine in 2016 means going to a place like Printed Matter, right? Mm -hmm. And being surrounded by this whole world or going to the Zine Fest in Brooklyn. Um, being surrounded by this whole world which is countercultural. And that's what zines were like 20 years ago as well. Is that you didn't just read a zine, you read a zine and you're part of a subculture. Um, whether it's a political subculture, uh, a sexual subculture, a musical subculture, you understood yourself as outside of society. In, in your book, you mentioned uh, the term uh, art zines. Um, can you tell me what you, uh, which one you were thinking about? Uh, Artisan? Art zines. Art zines. Oh, yeah. you know, I hate to tell you this. It's 20 years. Yeah. I, I can't <laughs> imagine. I, co I could not name any of them. I, mean, yeah. I wish I could, um, but I cannot. I, I don't okay. know. And, you know, maybe a bit uh, about contemporary art. You say that your uh, activism art is very far from that. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no, but yeah. Uh, so, do you see a, a paradox uh, in um, in making uh, zines of contemporary art? Um... I don't know if there's a, a paradox. I mean, it, it depends on what 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 is contemporary art trying to do. And I mm -hmm. think I think you know what's interesting about contemporary art is it doesn't know what it's trying to do at this mm -hmm. moment. Um, And so I don't necessarily see a paradox of making art that's also a zine. In fact, I see that as a continuity of what zines have always been quite good at. I see a paradox if then that becomes something which is displayed in a museum, put under glass, fetishized, cataloged, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. That becomes a paradox because zines, by their very nature, are meant to be disposable, they're meant to be re re you know, reproducible, and they're meant not to be a way to showcase the talents of those who are already trained, but to actually sort of give an outlet for those that don't have training. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of art and zines, I would say that zines have always been about art mm -hmm. um, at some level or another, the, the art of writing, the art of thinking, um, but also aesthetically, the whole cut and paste aesthetic of zines um, was an aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I once got asked, by, I got asked by the Smithsonian um, Museum of Design Uh, I forget what it's called here, but it's, it is the Smithsonian Museum of Design, but it's in New York, um, to come up and talk about the curation of the best zines and how they can collect the best zines. And one of the things I talked about 
is the fact is the best scenes were the worst scenes. And it's hard for a collector to wrap their head around that. That is, is that the zines that actually, what they were calling sort of zines that they had in their permanent collection were uninteresting from the point of zines. They were recognized, thereby recognized artists, essentially. Um, and I said that, you know, in order to understand fanzines, you have to understand that a lot of them are illegible. And that the true aesthetic of fanzines um, is about being an amateur, is about being sloppy, is about being smudged, is about having words misspelled, um, sentences which aren't beautiful, yet are somehow and communicate an authenticity. Perfect. Thank you.